time to introduce the keynote for the third day of the summit. So, so our speaker today is the founder and CEO of Realization Technologies, Sanjeev Gupta. Uh, um, um, under his leadership, the company has delivered more than $7 billion of documented impact on its customers' cash and profits. In 2016, Sanjeev received a Lifetime Award Achievement Award by the Theory of Constraints International Organization for his contributions to project and factory planning and control. Sanjeev Thanks, Cameron. Uh, so without much further ado, we will just get started. We know that project delivery, as Cameron said, is a big problem across the industry, across the construction industry. So this is some data from McKinsey. And then they also did a similar, uh, there's in fact in India, uh, the infrastructure projects are very important. There's a ministry level, federal ministry that monitors the performance of projects. And this is the data they had about projects in India. And of course, the difference here is that in India, it's not easy to spend more money. So the cost overrun is low, but the time overrun is high. Whereas in the developed world, you tend to throw money to recover the delays. So the delay is less, but the cost overrun is high. Now, if we talk to people, uh, these are the plausible causes. Right? Generally, everything that people can point to in terms of why projects were laid was either planning is poor or execution was poor, or maybe you know we did good planning, we had great execution, but there were factors outside of our control. Now, if there is something else that comes to your mind, please uh, put that into the chat box. But in the poor plans, again, if we listen to people, they'll say, hey, our targets were unrealistic to begin with. So because either we were under pressure to bid low or because management does not understand uh, how difficult it is to deliver the projects in such a tight timeline. Uh, sometimes people will say, hey, we need just need better planning tools. You know, the spreadsheets are not good enough, so we need Microsoft Project. Or if Microsoft Project is not good enough, maybe we need something like Primavera. And then a lot of people talk about, hey, the tools are awesome, but the tools cannot do much if you put garbage in. We really don't have good planners. And so this is what people talk about as the contributory causes of poor plans. Under poor execution is the same thing, more or less. We don't have good tools for visibility. You know, we don't really know what is going on. So we need real-time dashboards. Maybe we need drones. Maybe we need some analytical tools that will analyze the data for us. And, or people will say, you know, our execution teams on site in engineering, they, you know, we are not still learning. We are still maturing as an organization. Our projects are not our main business because we do these CapEx projects. Our main business is running factories or whatever. So our execution team is weak. And then people also talk about weak governance systems, which is really another way of saying accountability is poor. So that is why if people are not accountable, then they don't execute to the plan. Amongst the factors beyond our control, the usual litany is there are changes, changes in scope, changes in specifications, or maybe everything was fine, but the solution that we had in mind did not work. So we came up with new conditions. We were digging earth and we struck some uh, uh, unexpected uh, 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 objects during the digging. So we need to change the way we are going to lay the foundation, etc. Or people will talk about external delays. You know, our team is fine. Everything is great. But it's just those approvals that we need to get from the government. They are delayed or our customers did not give us the real approvals, or our suppliers did not deliver to us uh, their stuff on time. And then, uh, of course, limited resources. You know, limited resources, I'm specifically talking about not cash, not those kinds of things, but I'm talking about the resources that really affect the, how fast the project can be done, which is really capacity. It could be people, equipment, 
uh, managers who have to make decisions, coordinators, engineers, whatnot. Right. So these are the plausible causes. All of these sound plausible. Right. And no wonder uh, project management, improving project delivery has been such an intractable problem. Because if there are so many different reasons, what are you going to improve? You can't improve much. You know, you can improve a little bit of planning, a little bit of execution, but trying to improve everything in a large organization is kind of an impossible task. And the solutions also, people have tried the solutions for years. So it's not as if the industry is not worried about late projects because the impact of late projects is obvious to everyone. You know, if projects get done faster, uh, the owner of the project, they get to realize the benefits faster. The EPC company that is uh, handling the project for the owner, they uh, experience faster cash flow. They are able to do more projects with the same resources. If they are able to finish their projects faster, if they have equipment tied up, which will get freed up. The subcontractors, you know, the projects are getting done on time. For a lot of people in the construction industry, especially at the subcontractor level, at the small contractor level, cash flow is a big issue. Those people lie, live and die by cash. So for them, doing projects faster is important. So people are trying. And one of the things is we do is uh, we just throw more technology at it. You know, uh, in 1960s, when critical path was invented, you had the mainframe computer. Then in 80s, Primavera came about that Microsoft project. Now you have last planner. You have risk simulators because there are going to be all these unknown in the projects. So there's a plethora of information technology tools hardware and software that we keep throwing at it. Last year, just from a software app application software perspective, the industry spent about eight to $10 billion, right? And this investment in technology has been increasing over time, yet project performance is not improving. Uh, then we go to the second big bugaboo, which is our people need to be trained. So let's do more training, whether it's PMI, Lean Construction Institute, or training in specific tools, right? We are doing more and more training. And again, on training, uh, the estimates are you know, not easy to get, but my estimate is if I were to triangulate the amount of money being spent on training, it's somewhere between two to $5 billion a year. So a lot of money is being spent on training. Metrics, you know, we, start, we started with critical path-based metrics. Then we have earned value, we have rate charts, and people keep modifying earned value metrics. People keep coming with different ways of analyzing metrics and come up with innovative metrics. So we do keep throwing more and more metrics to ad address, for example, the governance problem or the accountability problem. Still, the situation is not improving. Uh, more processes, right? that is also something we try. You know, better process of planning, better process for scope management, risk management, which is a big thing in projects, or the reports, you know, let's introduce standardized reports, let's introduce standardized meetings in terms of project control meetings or the daily site management meetings. So we put, keep putting on more and more processes into the mix. And uh, in terms of factors beyond our control, we try to control them through better contracts so that the customers are more accountable, so that they don't keep changing the scope, so that uh, the vendors are more accountable and you introduce late delivery penalties, incentives. You also have things in the contract like approval cycles. If we submit an engineering drawing for approval, the customer is going to take 18 days to recycle the drawing back to you, either come back with a resolution or come back with comments. And so a lot of things have been done in terms of better contracts. But again, if you look at that, how many projects actually are able to enforce late delivery penalties? You know, anytime a project goes into late delivery penalty, it means the project is not going to get done. It's going to get stuck in arbitration. Incentives, yeah, you know, some sometimes incentives get realized, but uh, again, the the incentive to do projects faster is already there. Everyone knows that if we do project faster, we will gain as a business. Right, so things are not working. I think we are at a crisis point. And because the results are not improving, if you look at the, again, the data, 
uh, according to McKinsey, the projects from 1927 to 1998 had a better performance than projects in 1990 to 2015. And from the Ministry of Statistics and Program Information in India, the lateness of the projects, you know, 29 to 33% is kind of within the noise, but at a minimum, we can say it has stayed the same. It has not improved. So where do we go from here? Right? Instead of propounding one point of view or thought for this presentation, I will take a little bit more of a systematic approach, which is let's look at, right? So poor the planners can blame execution teams, execution teams can blame the planners, and you did not give us the plans. But both of them do blame factors beyond our control. Some companies might have good planning departments, some companies might have good execution teams, some companies might have both. So it's also very organization specific, right? But one thing that is common to all projects is this changes and external delays and resource limitations. So I would like to dive a little bit deeper into this part of the causes that people attribute for late projects, right? And we talked about the kind of changes and uh, resource limitations. And to simplify the analysis, I have taken the liberty of uh, splitting it into four quadrants. The first quadrant is a perfect world where you have unlimited resources, no delays, no changes. Quadrant four is the real world, which is limited resources, and you also have delays and changes. But I'm going to analyze the impact of delays and changes separately from the impact of limited resources. And let's see what happens. So let's just quickly run through a thought experiment. So let's start with the perfect world, right? So here is a simple project and it might look a little bit uh, uh, too small of a project, something that might not even qualify as a project, but it does represent the general structure of a project, which is, let's say you have to do drawings after you do get your drawings, then you are ready to do the next step, which is maybe doing the civil works. And similarly in parallel, you are doing laying some other foundation and then the foundation is completely laid maybe you're ready to do the installation. So I'm gonna call these points where different inputs, many in parallel inputs come together as integration points or assembly points, right? So in general, this is the structure of a project. So if you have to place uh, orders for an equipment, you have to finish all the different drawings in parallel before your procurement people can get started and start the bidding process. And you might have to get multiple pieces of equipment in place on site before you can start the installation. Or similarly, when you go on site, you might have uh, your, let's say you are constructing a, a commercial building. So you are doing some work on the first floor. Then after the uh, foundation is laid, the framing is done, you can start uh, doing the finishing process and you do multiple floors and you finish the entire building. Or you might have multiple buildings in parallel. And so this is a general structure of a project. Purposely, I've chosen a very simple example just to illustrate uh, the point that I'm going to make uh, about scheduling resource coordination, et cetera. So now if you look at this project, the critical path will tell us, hey, let's go and find the critical path of the project, which is 11 days plus seven days plus 10 days. So each act circle here is an activity. And B1 is the name of the activity, B2 is the name of the activity and so on. And G1 is the name of the activity, G2 is the name of the activity, and P1 is also the name of an activity. So in this case, the project is, the critical path is 28 days. Since there are no resource issues, no changes, no delays, if we find the critical path, we can promise a good date to our customer and achieve it, right? So critical path method works very well in this world. But we know the real world is not like this. So let's now go to the changes and delays. And you know, when critical path came out, also in parallel, what came out was the project evaluation and review techniques, primarily, you know, you can say slack analysis. Right? So now if you have delays and changes, let's say on the first activity, there is a delay of three days, either because inputs were delayed or the activity itself took longer. On the second activity, there is a delay of four days and you can read the rest of the diagram. So now if we look at it, you have significant delays. The first activity is delayed by 33%. The second activity is delayed by 100%. The fourth activity is delayed by 67%, right? 
but what is the impact on the project? It's uh, uh, you know, it's not much of an impact. And so critical path and PERT still work. And primarily what is happening is that even though lots of delays and changes are happening, they're happening in parallel. So the critical path has changed. So what we thought was going to be the critical path has now moved in execution to something else. And that's about it. Otherwise, the critical path works. And using per techniques, you can keep evaluating where the slack is if the critical path is about to change. You can even do upfront risk analysis of the project to say, hey, we assume this is the critical path, but if the critical path were to shift, what would happen? Right? And so between a combination of critical path and PERT, uh, things can still work out. Now let's go to the more interesting piece, limited resources. So the challenge for you here and you know, whoever is listening here is that you have four blue activities that need to be done, but you have only two people who can do those activities. So ideally I would like to have four people, one person for each activity working in parallel, but I have only two of those. Similarly, I have instead of two green activities, instead of two people, two crews for my installation of equipment, I have only one crew. And I have, I need one purple resource and I have one purple resource. So in this case, what would the plan be? And so if we look at the critical path logic, which is, it starts failing. It starts actually crumbling, not just failing. Because what the critical path would tell us is that, hey, the first blue resource, identify the critical path, which is B3 and so on, put that on the most critical path. Second blue resource, put that on the second most critical path, et cetera. And then you follow the same logic across the board. And you find that in this case, if there are no delays and changes, if the project happens exactly as planned, except that we have resource limitations, you think you can promise a 41 day uh, uh, duration to the customer. But in this particular case, in this very small project, you know, real life projects are much more complex. Tens of thousands of such activities, thousands to tens of thousands, or even hundreds to, let's say, up to 100,000. So in this simple case, where there are only seven activities, there are 24 different possibilities for scheduling. And what I have highlighted here is just six of those, right? And the only purpose here is to say that there is a wide variation. So there is a variation from 34 days to 42 days. So depending on how you deploy your resources, depending on who does what and when, the project can take somewhere between 34 days to 42 days, right? And by the way, the critical path logic gave you an answer in this particular case that was towards the worst case scenario. So, where do we go from here? Right? So you might uh, get excited with all the technology that is out there, fast computing power, et cetera. Right? Traditionally in the world of optimization operation research is called an NP hard problem, which is the amount of time it takes to process all the different combinations, find the right answer goes up exponentially as the number of nodes increases, as the number of activities increases, as the number of resources increases. Right, so it's a very tough problem, but you might say, hey, we can throw computing power at this, evaluate all the possibilities, come up with the best answer and be done, right? Unfortunately, you know, and we know that in the real world, you don't have enough data to create this optimized plan. Right? These are all the different reasons, which I'm not going to decide here, but bottom line is either you don't have data or the project will have changes or the project will have delays which means whatever you thought was the optimal answer at the beginning of the project by the end of the project something else might have become the optimal answer so really there is no predictability that you can get with an optimized schedule not to mention that whatever you thought is optimal is not going to be optimal by the time the project ends now how does this problem of resource scheduling show itself in execution 
it really shows up as something like this. Even if you have limited resources, you will see situations where resources are waiting for work. So in this particular case, what you will see is that under option three, the green resource is waiting for a longer time before they can start their work than in option two. Right? So even the limited resources, they end up waiting for work. And on the other side, you always have the situation where work is waiting for resources. And in fact, what happens is if you go towards some key uh, milestones in the projects or key integration points or key testing points in the project, what you will find is there's bow waves of work. So you are starved for work and then suddenly there's a bow wave of work that comes along and then you are overloaded. Right? And according to the Associated Schools of Construction, from their 2017 one of the papers that this coordination problem accounts for 25 to 50 percent of the time in projects so i think this is where the opportunity is provided we can solve this seemingly very complex problem of scheduling provided we can solve this problem knowing that there will be changes and delays provided we can solve this problem knowing that we don't even have a lot of data when we enter a project about the detailed activities, right? So hopefully you will see that what there is a practical solution that is possible. But before we go there, let's look at the combined impact of resource limitations and changes in delays. Right? so what you will see is the same scenario, which is there's a wide variation from one option to another option. You know, it, the project can take anywhere in this case from 38 days to 47 days. And also there's a wide variation between the plan and the actual. In some cases, the variation is less. In some cases, the variation is higher. So I think we, instead of diving into detailed optimization and creating another infeasible solution, let's step back and see what is the general pattern here, right? And again, this is a pattern which is not going to be right 100% of the times, but if we can find the right pattern, my experience is that you will get close enough to a good enough answer. So what is the pattern? Just spend a couple of minutes to see this option two and option six, which seem to be the best option. How are those two options different from the rest of the options? And similarly here, again, option two and option six, how is our resource deployment different in these two options versus the rest of the options? And if you want, you can type it in the chat box also. Okay. So let's see what is the pattern here. Right, so the one pattern you will see is that the two options were doing something interesting, which I'm calling the golden rule of focus and finish, which is when you have limited resources, in our case, blue resources are limited. We had only two of them. So instead of scattering those blue resources across multiple green points, focus those resources around one green point, whether you put them here first or you put them here first, but you will get the best answer if you focus your resources. And these green points is what I'm calling integration points. Integration points means uh, you have multiple parallel inputs that are coming in, getting integrated and processed before you move on to the next step. Right? And the common sense rationale for this is also simple. Every project is nothing but a series of such integration points. And the faster we can get to the integration point, the faster the project flows. So by concentrating our resources around integration points, we are making sure that at least one of the green boxes can start early instead of both the green boxes getting delayed. And if we do that repeatedly through the project, likelihood that the project will finish faster is higher. Something else that is interesting that happens that when we split our resources across these in green boxes, these green dots, what we find is that since I have only one blue resource to work on B1 and B2, 
the delays, they get serialized. There's a three-day delay, then there's a four-day delay. So total impact on G1 is a seven-day delay in star. But when I put all my resources here, the, both the resources, only the worst case delay is passing on, right? Which is by concentrating my resources, locally I have created a situation where there is work happening in parallel. Therefore, my plan is a little bit more robust. My impact or delays is a little bit more controlled, right? This is what we think is a common sense breakthrough approach to resource schedule, which is don't get down to the minutia, but think of a strategy, right? And this strategy will hold. I don't need to know the details inside this rectangular box in precise detail. I could even add dots when I go into execution. In an execution, I might even change the sequence Instead of doing WS1 after WS2, I might say do WS1 before WS2. Right? My planning becomes simplified because now instead of dealing with a 100,000 line item plan for a project, if I adopt this strategy in the case of, let's say, thermal power construction, what you will find is you end up with about 1,000 such boxes. And uh, I will show you later, you don't even have to make decisions about 1,000 boxes. You just need to make decisions about the first few boxes. I will talk about that in about three minutes. Right? There are just two, uh, three other kinds of these focus and finish boxes. One kind of focus and finish box is this around integration points. Uh, others are what I call interactive work. So let's say that you are doing electrical design and mechanical design. In theory, they are in working independently different resources, but in the practical world, they need to exchange information between them. So we don't want these people to be working to different schedules. We want these people to be working in tandem. So the best strategy is not to treat them as separate resources, but to treat the team of mechanical and electrical engineers as one team and give them this box to go and execute. And then that will ensure that this interactive work is happening without delays. Uh, another focus and finish box is iterative work. You know, iterative iterations are very common when you're running experiments or doing investigation, or you're doing a design where you have to do trial and error. You do the design, you observe the results, then you make changes and you keep doing it until you end up with a good design. Or even the approval process. You know, you send uh, some drawing to your customer. Uh, you are working in a power plant, nuclear power plant. Your customer needs to approve the drawings. So you send it to them. They sit around, they send it back. You say, no, this 14 day turnaround time is not a good practice. Instead, we will say when the customer team is ready and our team is ready, we are going to assign this box of drawings to them. And the output is an approved set of drawings. And instead of taking 14 days between each iteration, we will try to get it done in about 15 days. And we have successfully done this in many, many cases. And the final case of a focus and finish box is a clear work done. You have different parties, different vendors, you have the civil works coming in, then the installation crew comes in. Theoretically, you can start a little bit of installation before the entire civil works is done. But in the real world, you want a clear work front so that there is no interference. The civil people come in, get out. The installation people come in. So that is another example of defining a focus and finish box. Right? Now, if we take this focus and finish box approach to slightly more complicated projects. Again, real world projects are going to be even more complicated, but just stay with me. Imagine you have three different pieces of equipment for which engineering needs to be done, foundation needs to be done, some equipment installation needs to be done, and then, then they both, everything comes together. So there are these three different work streams. For simplicity's sake, let's say that all these three work streams are exactly the same and they need the same kind of resources. If work stream number one gets all the blue resources it needs, which is the engineering resources, gets all the civil works resources it needs, gets all the installation resources it needs, it can get done in five plus seven plus 11, which is 16 weeks. And if you have enough resources for every work stream, you can get the entire project done in 16 weeks. 
But in the real world, we got only one third of the resources we needed, which means instead of getting uh, three crews of blue people, three crews of green, three crews of purple, we got only one crew each. So how would we go about using limited capacity? So if we follow the traditional approach, especially the critical path or some optimization approach, we will do something like this. We will get down to the details of every task. We'll try to create a detailed schedule. We'll try to make sure resources are not sitting idle. So as soon as work is done and the resource is available, we take on work on another work stream, then we move it back and we keep moving these resources. And, and we also get some overlap you know, because we don't need to finish the entire blue box for every project. We can start after this, before the last blue dot is done, we can start the green dot before that. And we get a completion time of 37 and a half weeks. Now, let's look at the alternative approach of focus and finish and see the, almost the magical output. In this, what we are saying is the only rule we are imposing is no matter what, you will finish the entire box before you will move your resources to the second work screen, whether it is for the blue resources or the green or the purple. And now what you see is my project gets done in five plus seven plus seven plus seven plus four, 30 weeks. This is the plan, right? Of course, there will be changes and delays in execution. So we know that. But from a planning perspective, you are already getting a better. Moreover, I don't need to worry about a very detailed schedule and making sure I put in a lot of different constraints in my Microsoft project or Primavera to kind of get the schedule just right. I am just doing a very a schedule at this focus and finish box level. Look at the capacity needs. In this particular case, your resources are going to be short all the time. In this particular case, you have enough resources uh, most of the time. And the place where you kind of really have a resource constraint is around the green box. Your data requirements are lower. I think one more important thing, which is getting into the execution side. Once we start level loading, our schedule at a detailed level, we eat up all the slack that is available in the project. And when we eat up all the slack, what it means is that anytime there's a small delay, it affects not only that project, but the other projects as well, because now the resource that was supposed to have finished work on the first project was supposed to move on to the second project or the second work stream. Now that work stream is delayed. So any small delay in any part of the project impacts the entire project. In this case, even if the blue activity is delayed, it affects only the green. It does not affect the second blue because there is enough of a time buffer available here. Right? So what happens when you work according to focus and finish boxes, instead of eating up all the slack, you actually consolidate the slack into what we call buffers. And this is also magical. And now let's see what happens in execution. If my new tasks get added, new dots get added, do I have to really go and change my schedule? My scheduling strategy will remain the same. Right? Does management have to make decisions about nine boxes? Or really the only decision the management has to make is about the first walk in every work stream. Because once you decide, which work stream to start first and then second and then third, the rest of the execution is automated, automatic. You know, rest of the decisions are automatic. So remember I was talking about the thermal power plant. So 100,000 tasks to schedule, you boiled it down to 1,000 boxes, but out of 1,000 boxes, you really end up, when we look at that project, you end up with about 10 or 11 decisions at the beginning of the project to say which work stream gets started first. And when you start that work stream uh, in engineering, then again in, a, in the installation part, you might again have to make that decision once again, but it's not thousands and hundreds of thousands of decisions that you are having to make every day, right? And there's a buffer. So even if delays happen, the delays get absorbed. Like we talked about, you know, these buffers are magical, we did not, pull them out of thin air, even though it looks like that. Really all we did was by doing this focus and finish approach, the slack that is inherent in the project, it gets consolidated into these buffers. 
And now think about it. Let's say that you have a resource decision to make, right? Because this is a very simple project. In real projects, all the work streams are of different lengths. You might have parallel things going on in blue because you might have more resources. Now, when you have to decide on where to put the resources, all you have to do is look at how fast the buffer is getting consumed. Wherever the buffer is getting consumed at the fastest rate, compared to the amount of work that is getting completed, that is where you put your resources. So you have relieved the front line also from making major scheduling decisions, right? The, you have automated the process where it's obvious where to put the resources. Now, of course, the front line has to go and manage what happens inside the box, which dot gets done first, which dot gets done second, but supervisors can manage that. Engineering team leads can manage that. What they cannot manage is when you have tasks coming from different work streams and multiple projects getting thrown at, their, at them, then everyone is just making seemingly random decisions or people are making decisions based on inconsistent criteria. You know, someone might say, let me do the hardest work first. Someone might say, let me do the easiest work first. One contractor might say, let me focus on my cash flow. Another one might say, let me focus on my last, late delivery penalties. Right? So you will have no way of getting a synchronization. But in this particular case, you say, you know, the box level plan is an agreed upon plan at the project level. And everyone is working according to the box level plan while they have flexibility to manage the dots inside the boxes. Right? And it's really that simple. So to recap, what we are saying is coordination is a big problem in projects. 25 to 50% of the time in projects is a coordination loss, which is resources waiting for work or work waiting for resources. And our problem that we have to solve is what is the best way to allocate limited resources and prioritize the work? And the complexity is that the world of projects is not very precise, is not very predictable. So we have to achieve this in an uncertain world. So how do we do that? And the answer is general strategy is focus and finish. And instead of creating a detailed schedule, what you create, what we call is just a resource deployment map. So instead of a detailed schedule for every task, you just have a resource deployment map, which looks like these boxes and some priority decisions around which works team gets started first. This is your resource deployment map. And once you have that, voila, you know, your project is going to be going much faster. Your critical path is going to remain stable. And let me just point out, if your critical path is changing all the time, what that means is, let's say there's a delay here. And today it says there's a delay here, which means, uh, you know, maybe we want to air freight something from the green box over here so that we can recover the schedule. But if the critical path has changed, the decision that you just took for a, an activity three months out has been rendered useless. In this particular case, your decisions hold true so you can make proactive decisions finally. And uh, you can go to our website and look at some of the uh, results, realization.com customer results. Right? You can see actual videos on YouTube of actual customers presenting you know, how simpler their life became and how their projects started getting done faster. And I think where uh, my, my zeal here is that projects are not just some things that exist on paper or some money making thing. They are, right? But projects are also how nations get built. Projects is how economic growth occurs. Projects is how millions and millions of people get lifted above the poverty line. Projects is how people get access to water and sanitation and the and good sanitation and good sewage facilities inside a city. So late projects have a huge cost and it's just not in the developing world is also increasingly true of the country where I live, the US, where you don't have your infrastructure is kind of crumbling. It used to be a great infrastructure. You don't have unlimited resources moving forward. 
So you need to achieve a lot. Every way we look at projects, you need to achieve a lot with limited resources. So I think it's almost our professional duty to make late projects a thing of the past. And for that, the I hopefully the main message I've con conveyed is that let's stop pursuing dead ends, more training, more software, more visibility, more analytical tools, let's blame the contractors, let's write more on risk contract that cannot be enforced. Let's, you know, uh, let's uh, make sure the scope chain never happens in a project. Let's try to estimate scope better. Those are all dead ends. A simple problem to attack is this coordination loss problem. And the final thing is keep the solution simple. If you choose a very complicated optimization approach, I think you know that that will never work in the real world for two reasons. One is the data is not available. Secondly, if people on the front line don't understand the schedule, they will not follow it. Uh, with that, I would like to open it up for any feedback, comments, questions, etc. Great. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Sanjeev, yes, let's make things simple, let's make solutions simple, let's make late, late projects a thing of the past. Can you please unshare your screen? Uh, very good, thank you. So we've had a very several good questions. I'm going to ask you the questions um, and you respond. Let me just go to this page. Okay, so first question is from Francisco. Uh, is this approach similar to the critical chain technique? So Francisco, critical chain approach is kind of a modified critical path approach, right? What we are suggesting is even for critical chain to work, you need to think about this focus and finish boxes. If you apply the critical chain at the box level, at the box level versus at the dot level, if you go to the dot level, in critical chain, you never get them to get the buffers. You know, the slack is all gone. So the buffer aspect here is similar to the critical chain approach. But the fact that we are applying the sources in focus and finish boxes, I think that is more fundamental than whether you use critical path or critical chain on top of it. Very good. So there is a question. From Sonam, is there any formula or rule of thumb to calculate the possibilities in quadrant three? I don't remember what was quadrant three. Yeah, yeah, that's very good. So Sonam, yes. Uh, I mean, uh, so in this particular case, the answer was kind of simple. You had four blue boxes to choose and you had two resources. So you can apply the combinatorial formula for that, multiplied by the number of combinations you get for the green boxes, right? And so there's a formula, but here is the uh, upshot. In a project network with 100,000 or 10,000 or even 1,000 activities, the number of combinations is going to be in hundreds of thousands to millions. Very good. So there is a question from Vijay. Is the integration point part of the change management process? Uh, I'm sorry, I do not understand the question. The integration point, the way I have described it is a natural thing that occurs in projects. When multiple inputs need to come together from in parallel, and then there's the next step which takes inputs, multiple inputs in parallel and processes them. That is what I mean by an integration point, right? But defining the focus and finish box is a change management, right? Getting everyone to define these boxes and stick to those boxes in execution. Yes, Vijay, that is a change management aspect. Great, thank you. So there is a question, a couple of questions from Rosalina. Uh, she's asking, how do we verify the resource allocation and coordination is accurate for the project prior to the execution phase? Resources also include management decision makers. Should we include patterns yeah. of poor or delayed decisions made throughout the projects impacting resource performance and project delivery? Yes. So if I may rephrase the question and please you know, tell me if I'm wrong in rephrasing the question. So what you are saying, I think, is two things. One is not only did you have 
people who do the work, but also these indirect resources, level of support resources like managers, coordinators who need to make decisions, chase things. I think the second question you were maybe saying is, a priori, we might not know how many resources we have and that might change in execution, right? So, uh, uh, so that is fine, right? So the main thing here is defining this resource deployment map, which is these boxes and a priority for these boxes. And so when we get into execution, then the resource deployment, whether we knew about those resources up front. So for example, we might assume, hey, we're not going to have enough fabrication people, but when we get to execution, what we find is the project is getting delayed because the purchasing cycle is getting delayed, right? So we can change it. Great, so another question from Rosalina, she's asking when should the resource scheduling analysis in focus and finish be performed uh, is it during the project initiation process where should we when should we do that great great question rosalina so i first gave a long winded answer then i will summarize it if you don't mind so long winded answer is that whenever a project is in trouble so we have done projects where we enter project when is midway so we can do that at that time because what is material is moving forward, how do we execute the schedule, the project in the best possible schedule? We can do it at the project initiation also, but increasingly what we find is that even before tendering process, it's good to create this resource deployment map because your tenders and bidding process can be around it. You, know, you understand the criticality of things. So, the earlier you can do it, the better it is. So this is one answer I'm going to give you. This, but you can do it at any time. And whenever you do it from that point on, the performance of the project will improve. The second point is that this box level, focus and finish box plan is best if it is a shared plan between the owner, the uh, main general contractor, and even the subcontractor for their part of it. So it's not as if the owner just creates an L1 schedule and the EPC company submits an L2 schedule and then people submit more detailed schedules. And that schedule is useless. Great. Uh, Sanjeev, a question from Joel Martinez. Uh, he's asking, how should someone with no scheduling experience get started and what steps should they take if they want to begin learning and applying some of the more advanced and flexible methods of this presentation? Yes. So I think if you do, after the presentation, when you go back and think about it, what you will see is what I've highlighted to is pretty straightforward. I think you did not need an expert or so-called expert like me to come and make this presentation. I think the approach is pretty common sense and pretty straightforward. So if you think about it, you'll be able to apply. It, right. Of course, when it's a complex project, you need tools, etc. And I want to just tell you the story of I had a landscape uh, contractor I used him in for three houses in Silicon Valley right by the time he came to the third house I asked him his name is Baltasar Baltasar hey can I teach you a better way to schedule he goes no 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 do you don't know how to do scheduling my scheduling world is very complex I said do you want to make more money he goes yeah absolutely so he was doing about 17 or 18 landscaping projects in parallel with a crew of about 30 people. And he was always running behind schedule, always running in cash flow issues. Using the focus and finish approach, the moment he understood it, he went from doing 15 to 17 projects in parallel to about six projects in parallel. His turnover went from about one and a half million dollars a year to about $7 million a year. The projects came down from six months to a month, from 35 days, 40 days to about 15 days. And he shared his presentation in an international conference where he's, his uh, punchline was he started his life in a house where seven or eight brothers and sisters where there was no bathroom. And then he showed the picture of his mansion that he was building because of the money that he made. So the point being the approach is pretty straightforward right if you think about it you should be able to apply of course when the project gets complex you need to sit back and do some homework and you might need better tools etc 
Great, thank you. Uh, question, I think some people who have visited your booth, uh, realization booth, they have seen also the term project flow management. They just want to know the difference or are these the same? Uh, can you great shed question. more light on it? That's a great question. So I think two things, the focus and finish is what enables the project to keep flowing. So at a high level, what we are saying is, you know, it's not important to manage the activities. It's important to manage the flow. The faster the project flows with minimum waiting time, the better off you are. But the way to achieve flow is through this focus and finish, through this resource deployment map based on focus and finish. Okay, great. So Samuel has a question on the focus and finish method versus resource leveling. He's saying, do we say that the focus and finish method is same as resource leveling? Uh, to solve the issue of over allocation? Great, great point. I would just add one thing. So if I apply resource leveling at the box level versus the dot level, I'm automatically moving in the area of focus and finish, right? So it's a matter of, do you do resource leveling at the dot level or at a high level box? Level? That is kind of one difference. I think the second point is, which is important, in execution, what happens a lot of times, Simon, is that you get stuck on some dots inside a box. The tendency is to move resources from that box to another box. Right? The control that we need to exercise is do not start another box. Because the moment you move resources from one box to another box, guess what? So you are waiting for two days over there and you move the resources. Now the resources are going to be stuck somewhere else for three weeks. Suddenly, what was a two day delay? became a three week delay, right? So it is important to adhere to that concept of focus and finish at the box level in execution. Great, so there is a question from Audrey. Uh, I work for a very small company. Our employees are each involved in several activities simultaneously. Is it better to focus on one task at a time and finish it instead of multitasking too much? Is this what you mean by using focus and finish boxes? Great question, Audrey. So I would say definitely stop multitasking, but go a level above the task. Right? You don't look at just the task in isolation. You look at the grouping of tasks that is needed to accomplish a certain phase of the project or achieve a certain milestone. Right? So, Multitasking just means, for example, Cameron and Sanjeev are focused on one task at a time and they finish the task. Focus and finish at a higher level would mean that Sanjeev and Cameron are focused on the same box, multiple tasks in the same box. They finish all those tasks in the same box before moving on to another box. Yes. Um, next question, Robert Mattia. Do you determine resource requirements based on quantities or based on best guess? Great. You can do either, right? Because sometimes you have bill of quantities available. You have some idea available from there, right? When you have volume of work kind of things, especially, and you just have the standards at the volume at the work level and you multiply by the volume of work. But sometimes when you're doing engineering work, like not at the drawing level, but kind of thinking engineering, or you're doing installation, then you have to do an estimate, right? And the good news is we don't have to be precise. We don't have to be precise and we cannot be precise. And right? we just have to be good enough. Great, so I think this is last question as, as far as I see here, Lucy Bozzi, asking what is your definition of criticality in flow management and how do you account for it? Very great, great question. So Lucy, I would say a couple of things. One is at the planning time or at the decision time of which work stream to take on first, right? That criticality is a, a combination of business and scheduling decisions, right? What does a business decision mean? Even though work stream one might be the longest stream of string of activities, you might want to do work stream two first because it's going to bring in faster cash. Or you might want to do work stream two first because there's a higher risk associated with it. Right? So there is a decision time where the criticality, you know, in terms of deciding which work stream to start first, 
there's a slightly different decision from when you get into execution and now you're trying to decide which box to give the resources to. So you've already decided which work stream you're going to start. And now you have a resource conflict between those work streams, right? Over there, the simplest answer for determining criticality is through the buffers. You look at how much buffer is remaining versus the rate at which you are progressing along the work stream, and that will give you the criticality. Great, thank you very much, Sanjeev. Great presentation, great questions, everyone. Um, uh, is there any other question? Sure. Oh, there is one more question. Maybe we answer that and then, uh, then we finish the session. Asma uh, asking, how do you do the grouping of the boxes? Manually, P6, other ways? Great, another great question. First of all, I'm very happy that I, that it looks like everyone was listening. So they're asking great detailed follow-up questions. So thank you very much for that. So the boxes, you know, I think there are twofold questions you're asking. One is how do we define the boxes like conceptually? Right? So that is regardless of the software. Like those boxes are, you sit down in a room, you look at the integration points, you look at clean work fronts policy, you look at iterative work, et cetera, and you define those boxes. And this is one part of it. The second part of it is, what do you do with those boxes? Now, one approach is to take that box level plan and put it into Primavera Microsoft project, it's going to be fine, but then you're going to lose visibility of the dots because the moment you put dots into Primavera, Primavera will start doing its critical path slack analysis at the dot level, right? So what, that is the reason we had to create the software where you can have boxes and dots in one integrated plan across multiple parties, different enterprises, but the primary scheduling logic algorithm is running at the box level. And from there we are deriving what happens at the dot level. So we don't have to have many, many different files where you have boxes in one plan and for each box, then you have a dot level plan separately in another file. Great, so I think I missed one question from Sonam. He's asking in mode B of focus and finish, what if first activities in all three work streams are totally different from each other that require different resources? Great question, so then you can do them, but make sure that downstream there are no common activities, that is one, right? So the, the first box might be blue for one and light blue for another one, and uh, yellow for another work stream, but maybe the second box is the same. Right? So then you need to look at the that box. That is one. The second thing I would say is I think you know in projects, which is people who are assigned to tasks is only one type of resources. Sometimes the more critical resource is the management resource. Right? Think about it. People who come first on site and leave the last are the management people because they are involved in many decisions. Right? So it might look like, you know, the resources are different for the three work streams, but from a management standpoint, you might be able to handle only two work streams at a time, right? So don't lose sight of these, what I call invisible level of effort resources, because quite a few number of times, they end up determining the speed of the project. Yes, so uh, still one last question is here that I have to ask before we end the session, although we're one minute over time, but I'm just going to ask that as well. So Lucy is asking what BHP projects use this method and what was the feedback you received? So I think BHP is one of the clients. Um, what feedback yes, have you yes. received regarding their projects? Yeah, so we have some videos from BHP Billiton. This was in Australia. Right? So this was for development, I think, of their related to the coal mine. It was a project quite some time ago and now the su successor to BHP South 32 is deploying it across enterprise, across the enterprise, right? Uh, I'm sorry, Lucy, uh, I don't have the exact information at my fingertips, but just reach out to us and we will get you that information. Exactly, so I think this is the, the, the point uh, that I wanted also to make. If you have more questions right now, Navneet from Realization is on their booth, go to the virtual booth. He also has some resources. There is also a resource to download over there. 
Let's go check it out, ask questions, follow up, because the team is fully open to engage, to have call with you, to even talk about your specific projects and then see how this methodology can be applied in your projects. So with that, thank you, thank you very much, Sanjeev. Thank you for supporting uh, Project Control Summit Realization Technologies and everyone else. Thank you for attending. Uh, we move on to the next session. All right, Cameron. Thank you, everyone.